cellular life can survive and thrive as single cells. Or as filaments. Or even longer filaments. It can survive as circles or two-dimensional mats or even three-dimensional structures. But in a 3D body, the cells on the inside are not exposed to the environment. Life solved this problem by evolving different kinds of cells, by evolving complex multicellularity. Now we have talked about endosymbiosis. And we've talked about the examples of primary endosymbiosis, actually when a mitochondria, when a, a free-living bacteria gets engulfed, and then another thing gets engulfed and becomes a plastid, and then that whole cell gets engulfed by another whole cell. And that's not really multicellularity. It's kind of a way for life to be nested inside of itself. But there's another type of way of joining cells, and that is just joining them like here, and here, and here, and here, to become multicellular. Rather than nested inside, you become sitting next to each other. And that's what we are. We have cells next to cells next to cells. So, this is the tree of all life, and the bacteria are here, sometimes called single cells, but really, they are single cells, and they are filaments, and there are mats, and, uh, but the type of complex multicellularity um, is right over here in eukaryotes. Now, we know from this chart that life on Earth started out unicellular, or filaments, or bacterial, and then they diversified, and they became multicellular, at least along the lineage that led to the eukaryotes. Now, the question we're going to talk about today is, maybe life in general starts out unicellular, but will it too, well, well life in general means life on other planets, Will it too diversify and become multicellular like life on Earth did? Now remember, life on Earth became multicellular only along this lineage, but it stayed unicellular in all its different wonderful ways along these other lineages. So life didn't just become multicellular, it also stayed unicellular and filamentous and lots of different kinds of, of simple multicellularities. Now, here up here in the corner, as prochlorococcus. That's one of those simple unicellular things. And then in this diagram, we see two multicellular apistocons, a and who are they? A human and a giant blue whale. That's, those are us. Matter of fact, they both used to be amphibians, and maybe that's why the human looks like an amphibian there. How did multicellularity evolve on Earth? If it happened more than once independently, then multicellularity becomes a good candidate for what we should expect from extraterrestrial life. This is an argument, this is a type of argument that we astrobiologists really like because we want to link what we can see on Earth to what we expect might have happened elsewhere. How easy is multicellularity? Well, let's look at some of the literature. Here is Andrew Knoll, and he wrote a wonderful review paper on the multiple origins of complex multicellularity. Notice it's not simple multicellularity or multicellularity, it's complex multicellularity. And that's kind of problematic. What does that mean? How do you define complex? Well, we're not quite sure. But here's what he said. He said that complex multicellularity has evolved six times. Now the implication is it has evolved six times independently. So here's what the claim is. Here's a chart of all eukaryotes. And here you can see animals and coanoflagellates and fungi and amoebas and green algae, et cetera, et cetera. Now the, the text in red are the ones where we have these the six times that complex multicellularity has evolved. So we have animals and two types of fungi, et cetera. Now remember that eukaryotes are a small part of life on Earth. For example, when we plot this tree of all life on Earth, the eukaryotes are down here in green. And in previous lectures or videos, we looked at this eukaryotes and we used this pie chart to talk about them. It's kind of like a phylogenetic tree superimposed on a pie. Well, let's look at this more carefully. So here is the blow up of that. And let's look at where these 
independent origins of multi complex multicellularity happen on this pie chart? Well, there's animals, number one. And where are they? They're right here in the lower right. Now what about there's two and three types, the two and three, the third type of evolution of complex multicellularity are on this asco ascomyces and basidiomyces. And where are they? They're right there on this chart. They're very closely related. Notice there are a lot of other fungi that are not, don't have what he calls complex multicellularity. How about the, th the fourth one? Embryophytes, where are they? They're right there on this chart. Then there are red algae, fluoridophytes. Where they're number five, and that's where they are. And then we have this laminarial Leon brown algae. Where is that? And they are number six, and they are right there. So a little bit different from the other ones. So the question is, are these really independent origins of what he calls complex multicellularity? Well, what about slime molds and dictostilium, discoidum? They are not included in what he calls uh, complex multicellularity, but let's have a look at what they do. Now, here's a movie, and now what you can see that these are single cells, and I'm going to show you them moving around, and we're going to starve them and see what they do. So here are the cells moving around. They're all different. They're all separate from each other. And they're saying, hey, where's some food? Where's some food? And uh, I guess the food is kind of scarce. And then you'll see them getting together as one in the middle there, a little bit to the right. And they'll say, hey, let's do something different. Let's, let's get together. Let's form a multicellular organism. And so you can see them piling up and piling up, aggregating and aggregating. And, to and what they form, and watch this, is a slug. A single slug made up of all those formerly independent single cells. And then the slug says, OK, I'm going to crawl out of here. So you have to have some kind of coordination for this slug. And it's crawling out of there. Let's get out of this region where there is no food and it crawls kind of like a worm. It crawls over to the lower left here, and then it says, well, you know, I don't find any food, so I'm just going to turn into a stalk, and I'm going to grow up and make some spores, and hopefully the spores will blow away. And that's what we see here on the lower left. It's growing, 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 and then we can see just the stalk, and the top where the spores are goes off the picture. So what we've just seen are single-celled critters that have become multicellular and looked like uh, they were as complex multicellular as a, as a worm. But notice that slime molds, where this arrow is pointing in the lower part of this diagram in yellow, the amoebozoa, they are not considered to have complex multicellularity, which should be a clue that tells you that the word complex, I mean, what does that mean? How can you say that this slug that crawls around and then turns into a stalk is not uh, a result of complex multicellularity, but maybe something more simple. In any case, the definition of multicellularity, simple or complex, is fraught. Now, now let's look at something else. And these are, we're animals. Now, at the base of the tree of animals, sometimes not considered to be a metazoan or an animal, are these things called coanoflagellates. And you can see them on the left here. They form a little colony, and then there's a picture of them in the, the, the second from the left. Now, interestingly, when you look at sponges, which are also, which are deeply rooted in the tree of life in our lineage, they look like they're made out of these coanoflagellates. And so you can see the, the cross section there of a sponge, and you can see these coanocytes inside of a sponge, which look very, very much like coanoflagellates, which are considered to be single-celled or colonies. So there's a, a real interesting relationship between these two where we can link single-celled coanoflagellates to colonial coanoflagellates to getting together into a more integrated body, which we call a sponge, which we know is at the base of the animal tree of life. Now, another example of that is something called volvox. I mean, these are wonderful things. You see, it's a, a giant ball with very bright green balls inside of it. And the, so the giant ball is an organism, and inside of it are kind of like its gametes, kind of like sperm cells, but not really. They're kind of like miniature versions of the larger thing. And when you analyze the evolution of these vulvacine uh, critters, you can have a, a lineage here of increasing development of complexity, starting at the left. 
You know these things are bicons. Bi just means two, and cont means those little black lines coming out of them, kind of like flagella or undulopodia. And you can see the different types of vulvacine green algae. The one I just showed you was the one on the right called vulvox. Uh, but anyway, this is a rough approximation of the evolution of these green algae. And the conclusion of Holman in 2017 is, at the bottom, a surprisingly low amount of genomic innovation seems to be required for the evolutionary transition from unicellular to complex multicellular algae. He calls it complex, but uh, maybe it's more simple. Maybe it's uh, halfway between simple and complex. Who knows? And interestingly, in the far right, you can see clearly a separation between the germline cells and the somatic cells. The, the, the somatic cells are the cells of your body. They're the ones on the outside of vulvox. And the germline cells are the ones on the inside, the darker green, because they're going to be released and become, um, they're going to become vulvox in their own right and then develop germline cells inside of them. And in uh, any case, we have here the first indications of the separation of the germline and the somatic cells. And that's an important development for the evolution of sex and the evolution of death. So we've talked, we want to, I think there's a controversy and something that's not clear between what is unicellularity, and then you have filaments and bacterial mats like stromatolites. You have multinucleated single cells like slime molds. Then you have single cells but multicellular slime molds. Then you have colonies like volvox and quinoflagellates. Then you have simple multicellularity and complex multicellularity like worms and fish and dogs and humans. But this shouldn't be conceived of as a, as a one-dimensional progress towards us uh, because each one of these is represented today in extant organisms who are just as evolved as we are. If you're big and three-dimensional like a volvox or like this sponge, you've got to get food and oxygen to the inside. Now, if you're really big, like a pig, then you have to evolve some kind of tube to get food to the inside and excrete it. And you have to get some type of vascularization going here. So our vascularized 3D bodies with tubes and transport systems, something we should expect life elsewhere to have?